Okay, thank you very much uh, for all of you for remaining conscious this long and for this very last talk. And uh, very many thanks to the organizers for allowing me to present this work. Um, the nature of the talk is that I'm going to be talking in outline about a physicalist proposal about phenomenological consciousness, albeit involving extended physics, as you will see. So in that sense, it's pretty radical, if not rash. I'm not a physicist, so no doubt toes will be trodden upon. On the other hand, I have been quite encouraged by very roughly analogous sorts of suggestions that have been made by, in other talks at this very conference. So I'm going to give an outline of a philosophical argument that phenomenal consciousness is at least partly constituted of something that I call metacausation, which is a very unusual concept which does crop up in the philosophical literature, but not very much. And as far as I know, it hasn't been connected to consciousness. But I should caution you that people use the word metacausation in, in a variety of different ways, including for things like downwards causation, and I do not mean those things. We'll see in a minute what I do mean. Um, now, I, I am using the word causation, which actually I hate the word because it's so misleading. People talk about it in all sorts of different ways. And I'm going to explain at some point that really what I mean by it is a fundamental physical dynamism at the lowest level of physics. I don't mean causation at the normal everyday level of, of um, John uh, breaking the window by throwing a ball at it or something. And so my meta-causation is going to get rebranded as meta-dynamism. And I'm going to give some provisional small steps, baby steps, towards formalization of metadynamism and a suggestion about what I call metadynamic physical laws needed to regiment metadynamism. Um, so whatever your notion of causation is in general, it doesn't matter. Um, metacausation is when a causing, an instance of causation, itself directly as an entity causally influences something. And just to illustrate the structure of the idea, for some reason, certain people came to my mind when I was writing the slide. Donald's causing democracy to collapse caused Vlad to like him. The point being, it's the causing of democracy to collapse that caused Vlad to like him. Or more subtly, it could be the way Donald caused democracy to collapse caused Dom to like him. Dom is the re resident of number 10 Downing Street, by the way. Um, <laughs> And then um, there is a possibility, which I'm not going to talk about so much of, uh, I call that, sorry, I call that left-handed metacausation because the purple causing is on the left, the green causing is the metacausation, okay? Right-handed is where it's around the other way, so petulance caused Donald to cause democracy to collapse, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, now, going to the philosophical argument I mentioned, uh, I take consciousness to be, in the first instance, a property of physical processes. And by that, I mean genuine ones as opposed to what philosophers have called pseudo processes. So a genuine process has some sort of internal causal linkage, which is what is responsible for the unfolding of the states within that process. I take a minimal reflexivity assumption about conscious processes, which is related to, in fact, derived from, in my own thinking, from a very popular assumption about consciousness, which actually goes back to the phenomenologists such as Husserl and Sartre and so on. And that assumption is pre-reflective self-consciousness. I've got a different assumption, but it's, it's a sort of cousin of that. Um, and then uh, I claim that if you're to achieve that sort of reflexivity, the process must objectively pick, it, pick itself out as a process. It must pick itself out as a particular causal process. It must, so to speak, know its own identity. It must be able to identify itself. And then I argue that a good, and perhaps even the only way of achieving this, is for the process's internal causation, first of all, not to be reducible just to the trajectory of states, trajectory of states that the process goes through, but that the actual causation within the process has a metacausal influence on later stages of the process. Um, now, I'm not going to argue for what's on this slide. I just want to advertise the fact that although the previous slide was saying that metacausation is necessary for consciousness, I actually also conjecture that it's sufficient for it and indeed constitutive of the phenomenal core of consciousness. And indeed, I would say that in isolation, you could have a form of metacausation, highly reflexive, as we'll see in a minute, that constitutes something like what people have called contentless awareness, a basic sense of continuing existence, 
a sense of nowness, and this has been raised in various people's talks here. And indeed, the particular arrangement of metacausation that I imagine is of a sort of very abstract, loopy idea, loopy in the Hofstadter sense of strange loops, um, where you have an episode of metacausation that's metacausally affecting itself. So all there is is you've got metacausing whose metacausation is its, its, is its affecting of itself. And that is the very most basic form of consciousness, and I believe is a, is a sort of basic core of all phenomenal consciousness, that there's that at its core, but mixed in with, with a lot of other stuff in most states of consciousness. So a little more detail of the argument that uh, metacausation is needed for consciousness. My starting assumption, this reflectivity assumption, I call it pre-reflective autosensitivity. The pre-reflective means non-conceptual non-propositional, not involving thought in the normal sense. It doesn't involve concepts and, and so on. And so, in particular, for example, this would be suitable for uh, a worm. If you were to hypothesize that a worm is conscious, I'm not saying I'm doing that, but if you were to, the pre-reflectiveness here would be suitable for that purpose. <laughs> okay. um, now, the assumption is that the physical processing that constitutes an episode of experiencing is pre-reflectively sensitive to that very experiencing or processing itself. And the question then is going to be, how is it sensitive in that way? Um, I'm not assuming that that necessarily amounts to self-consciousness, by the way, not necessarily conscious of your own experiencing. I'm not saying that, it's a weaker assumption. But it does build in, smuggles in, an assumption that experiencing is identical to some sort of physical processing. Now, the core of the argument is really that there are problems achieving this sort of autosensitivity. So if you were to consider, for example, that a state in the process could represent previous states and also even represent the causal linkage between those states, which as an AI person is the first thing I would think of trying to do, there are deep philosophical problems with that because all of this has to be objective. It cannot be a matter of anybody's viewpoint whether a state is representing something. And if you look at current theories of representation, there's always some little nugget of observer relativity in there, which prevents complete objectivity. And there are other problems with representation, problems of misrepresentation and so forth. Another th suggestion you might make is that a state would have some sort of direct acquaintance, roughly in the Russellian sense of acquaintance, with previous states in that process. I believe that won't work either. I've got a rather elaborate thought experiment that tries to establish that that won't work um, and that you do need to somehow bring in the causal linking. It's not enough to be sensitive to the past states in themselves. Um, and if anybody's interested later, I could go through in person with the, about this thought experiment. And I then argue that metacausation provides a good way out. And in particular, that every moment throughout a conscious process, the causing within some sub-interval of the process up to that moment meta causes some suitable effect on the state at that moment. And by suitable, I put it in inverted commas, I don't know what that effect is in detail. That's for future work. I'm just saying that there exists some effect of a, some form, and that, will, that is what's uh, needed for consciousness. Um, OK. Now, I, lying behind all this, as you might already have, have guessed, if you um, know anything about the literature on causation, um, I have a very radical anti-human view of the universe, that the regularities of the, of the universe are not just there, just, they just happen to be there. The universe must unfold as it does according to the laws of, of physics. There's a necessitation there all the time. As, it, as, as the universe progresses, there's a sort of lawful pushing forward an ongoing lawful necessitating of the universe. So far, that's a sort of fairly common in the garden um, hum uh, Humean uh, idea, which have appeared in many forms. Uh, I believe, by the way, you can take, a, a, so to speak, a chunk of this dynamism in a localized spatiotemporal region of the universe. And the point is the dynamism uh, um, the dynamism in that region is not just the trajectory of states that that region goes through, it's the, it's the dynamism that's responsible for that trajectory. And I think this is where I get extra radical as an anti-Humean. Instead of just saying this dynamism is some sort of numinous, sort of odd metaphysical thing lying behind the universe or something like that, 
If you're going to assume it at all, make it a first class physical citizen of the universe. The dynamism is a real physical aspect of the universe, just as real, in fact, I would say more real than things like particles, um, magnetic fields, and so on. Um, so for me, causation is the dynamism. So that's what I'm going to mean by causation. And I include within that very sort of broad church, I include things like effects arising from entanglement and quantum collapse, even though many philosophers would not regard that as an example of causation. Um, and I, should, I want to emphasize a couple of things that these dynamism instances in particular regions of space-time as bona fide physical entities presumably can dynamically affect other entities in the universe, including other dynamism instances. This affecting that involves at least one dynamism instance is metadynamism, because it's dynamism involving dynamism instances. So it must be governed by new metadynamic physical laws that explicitly mention, so to speak, dynamism. They explicitly deal with dynamism. But I only propose that some particular form of metadynamism is required for consciousness. Not that any metadynamism constitutes consciousness. Um, the universe conceivably contains other forms of it, which may have nothing whatsoever to do with consciousness. And I have no view about how rare or ubiquitous such metadynamism is in the universe, um, whether it's the general form or the form needed for, for consciousness. OK, I'm going to switch now to giving some very, very basic mathematical tools which will just for the purpose of making the idea of metadynamism and the metadynamic laws a little bit more precise. They are baby steps, highly provisional, and I could change my ideas about them tomorrow. And, but there's a crucial point here that I don't believe that dynamism is a coherent notion as an attribute of points in space-time. So it's not like an electric field or something where you can define its value at a point of space-time. It's only... Um, appropriate regions of non-zero spatial and temporal extent. Um, and I, I don't know what appropriate means. There's some sort of constraints of convexity or connect internal connectivity or something like that. Anyway, I take the set AR to be the set of all appropriate regions in which we can define dynamism instances. And then for any point, um, for any point XT uh, in space-time, there's the set of regions, appropriate regions, that include the spatial point X and abut the time point T. In other words, the time interval of that region goes up to, but doesn't include T. It's an open interval ending at T. Um, and then I just assume that, that, that there's, oops, sorry, that there's a uh, domain of dynamism instances I leave unanalyzed. They're new physical entities, not reducible to ones in current physical theories. And then for any given point in space time, over all the abutting temporal, uh, abutting appropriate regions coming up to the current time, um, there's a dynamism instance in each such region. Each dynamism instance has a region, which I call its home region. Then I also let B of XT be <coughs> just to describe the ordinary base level state at XT involving electric fields, momenta, masses, energy, whatever you'd like to include. And then I call existing physical laws base level laws. They only mention these base level quantities. Their operating constitutes base level dynamism. But of course, they don't mention dynamism. They just mention momenta and energies and curvatures or whatever it might be. Um, metadynamic laws, by contrast, explicitly mention or involve dynamism itself in some way via things I call dynamism quantities. The operating of these laws constitutes metadynamism. Okay. And the, my current plan for dealing with all this is that a, dyna, a dynamism quantity expression is of this form. Q is some function of the current ordinary state and the dynamism instances up to the current time. And then I say for some or perhaps even all base level laws, all, the, all familiar physical laws in whatever physical theory you have, by the way, I, I, you may have seen I'm, I'm working entirely for now within a classical physical framework before I get into the complexities of quantum mechanics or general relativity or anything like that. Um, for all base level laws, I replace that law by a metadynamic version, DIN L. And it's the original law with some extra terms and factors that are these dynamism quantity expression. So as a sort of baby example, if you had a law of this structure, some quantity U equals V times W at any given time then the modified law might be like this. So it has a multiplicative factor here, and then perhaps an, an additive term 
here. So it's modified in that way. And the point here is that the intention is that in, so to speak, normal regions of the universe, for instance, outside brains, perhaps, um, when things are operating normally, these dynamic versions of the basic laws will reduce to the basic laws because the Q expressions will be ineffectual. Their values will happen to be values like zero or one as, as necessary to, to stop them actually changing the operation of the law. It's only when um, the B argument and the D argument also collaborate to create conditions whereby Q produces an effectual value that the effect of the law is now changed. And then you get a metadynamic effect because you've got dynamism instances now affecting what's happened, happening when they wouldn't normally do so. Um, now, I should say that the idea of adjusting each current law is one possible route. I think it is the easiest route, but you could perhaps get by by having entirely separate new laws. I'm a bit open about that. Um, by the way, this adjustment of laws is a bit analogous to the sort of adjustment of the quantum state evolution function that uh, Kobe uh, Kremnitzer was talking about the other day. So it's an extra term in that function that does something. But I don't want to confine, my, confine myself to things like um, governing collapse. Um, now, from the point of view of the universe unfolding forward through time, one of these new dynamic, uh, metadynamic laws is left-handedly metadynamic in the sense that it's past dynamism instances affecting um, the current state and, and what happens in the future. Um, there might also be a need for laws that are right-handedly metadynamic, and I'm, I can't quite get my head around this as easily what those laws would look like, but those, what those laws would do would affect ongoing dynamism instances. They would mention ongoing or future dynamism instances. Um, but an alternative to that is something that came up in Adrian Kent's talk. He mentioned the idea of laws themselves being dynamically adjusted. So for instance, with a brain, within a brain, some effects might have the, some things going on might have the effect of changing a law. Now he wasn't quite talking about this sort of law here, but I could co-opt that idea and have the idea of um, activity changing some law in some way, and that might count possibly as right-handed metadynamism. I'm not sure about that. Then actually, this is my last uh, contentful slide. Um, I should, before I go into it, I should just emphasize that the maths I've just given merely is a start on getting a handle on the notion of metadynamism in general. It doesn't say anything about the specific metadynamism you might need for consciousness. Okay, I've made a little bit of a start on that. I, hadn't, I don't think there's time to include that, but I haven't made much of a start on that. Okay, so there's a tremendous amount of work left to be done. Um, but I just want to mention some other things which might be of interest to the audience. Uh, in orc or um, the collapse of uh, quantum wave function is, is governed by the gravitational self-energy of the superimposed states. But as far as I know, um, the, the current theory only governs the average time taken. So there's plenty of room left in the theory to add extra influences that would refine that time, or maybe even given a specific collapse time um, by other influences not so far included in the theory. Such additional influences could include metadynamic ones. And then I might propose that not all collapses involve any sort of consciousness, let alone proto-consciousness, or whatever that is. Um, perhaps it's only the ones that are metadynamically affected are the conscious ones. Turning to IIT, um, perhaps metacausation should be added as an extra requirement for consciousness. So it's not just a question of having a high phi value or the max phi value in some scheme of systems, but, but um, it's a, an extra side requirement. Although a neater idea would be to say, look, why shouldn't the phi measure uh, have a special uh, bit in it which measures the integratedness of the metacausation, not just the ordinary causation. Or it might even measure just the integratedness of the metacausation. And I think these moves could help alleviate some problems that have been presented to IIT as challenges. For instance, over-liberal attributions of consciousness and problems you get when you nest one conscious system within a bigger system and suddenly its consciousness vanishes and so forth. Various problems like that have been raised and I think this move could help. 
And then finally, related to IIT, these modules which have a quantum version of integrated information that came up again in, in um, Kobe Kremnitz's talk the other day, um, where the dynamics of collapse is controlled by a measure phi, also called phi there, of quantum integrated information, QII. Now, Kremnitz uh, et cetera, want to um, link this quantum information integrated information to consciousness. So it's not consciousness in itself which causes collapse, it's that that governs and controls the timing and uh, so on of collapse. Um, but consciousness has something to do with QII, so in that sort of indirect way it influences collapse. And then um, uh, perhaps that definition of phi could be made partly metadynamic, and then that could help refine the uh, the question of collapse, so perhaps the collapses that are involved with consciousness are precisely the ones that involve this metadynamism. Okay, so my concluding summary is to thank you for listening. Thank you very much.